Hello everyone. Welcome to the third lecture of the sixth module, which is on sequential circuit design. In the previous lectures, we have discussed about the static timing analysis, and we have looked at how to implement or how to realize the different registers using MOSFETs, basically using this transmission gate much spaced latches or any bistaple elemental. That is something that we have discussed already. In this lecture, we would be looking at some advanced designs or you know how we can tailor the design to meet certain constraints of these uh, you know registers or much spaced latches also we would be looking at some static latches right so the disclaimers remain the same now let us first look at the different variants of transmission gate much spaced latch so here you see a positive edge triggered register which is having a negative edge or sorry which is having a negative latch which is master and a positive latch which is slave. So this negative latch in series with positive latch in a master slave configuration leads to a register, positive edge triggered register. That is what we saw in the last lecture, right? Now if you look at its tape, like if you look at its <clears throat> design, you can see there are six inverters and four transmission gates. So there are a total of 20 <clears throat> MOSFETs. Out of them, 10 are B MOSFETs, 10 are N MOSFETs. Characteristics wise, since D input is connected to the input of an inverter, it shows you a high input impedance. And since Q is connected to the output of an inverter, it shows a low output impedance. And also there's full swing. So that way it's very good, right? However, since it's 20 MOSFET, area wise it's somewhat large. And also it is susceptible to clock overlap or clock skew that we'll discuss in this lecture itself in the later slides. <clears throat> now the question is, can we make it more area efficient? If Consumer says that, you know, I have to get something which is more area efficient or I want something with a lesser area. Although it will lead to some kind of performance degradation in other performance metrics, but, you know, if consumer has this need of a really low area, then can we reduce the area of this positive edge trigger register? So if you look at I1 and I4, can we remove them? Does it affect the functionality if we remove them? No. So the question is, can we remove it? And improve the speed and reduce the area. Why improve the speed? Because these, you know, these inverter delays will be removed. So, so this inverter delay we saw, it came in what? It came in the setup time, right? And I told earlier that in modern designs, the setup time and the register TCQ, register delay, these are two factors which you know influence your clock period. So if you can reduce the setup time by reducing the delay of this I1, then it would improve the speed. And also, since you are reducing four MOSFETs by removing these two inverters then it is also reducing area. And functionality wise, it's not affecting you much. Only the inverted version of D would be available at QM, and then it will be inverted finally when it reaches Q. So it's not affecting you much. So this is the design when you remove you know, your I1 and I4. It still acts like you know, a positive edge trigger, a positive edge trigger register. There are only four inverters and only four transmission gates. So you have like 16 MOSFETs, 8P MOSFETs, 8N MOSFETs. Although it has got lower area than before, but and the output impedance is low, and full swing is also there because it's a transmission gate, transmission gate based, uh, you know, design. But what you end up reducing, end up degrading the input impedance. The input impedance is no longer high, right? And what happens when the input impedance is not high? This will kind of you know sink some current from the fan out. So typically, it is connected to you know some other gates output and therefore if it is sinking a lot of current if the input impedance is not high it is sinking a lot of current then the effective fan out of that presiding gate that will reduce it won't be able to support more than one or more than two or maybe depending upon the level of current that it is sinking it won't be able to support more fan outs that's it. so input impedance high is something which is required especially when you are cascading the devices also this design is susceptible to clock overlap i mean regardless of whatever design you make of transmission gate mux spaced latch or even you know your uh, past transistor mux spaced latch they will be susceptible to clock overlap or clock skew and we'll reduce uh, and we'll see that later what exactly happens when there's a clock skew also we see that you know t2 and t4 they are in the feedback path even if we remove them the feedback path remains intact right it again like the feedback path is still like a bicycle latch will hold the data properly so can we remove T2 and T4 and further improve the speed and reduce the area? Let us see if it can be done. So once we do that, once we remove even, you know, your feedback, like T2 has been removed from here, T4 has been removed from here. So still what happens, it 
continues to act like a you know positive S trigger register. You have four inverters, two transmission gates. So the number of MOSFET reduces to what? It reduces to twelve, right? Six N MOSFETs and six P MOSFETs. Now, even you know a further improvement in this design. What can be done is we can actually replace this transmission gate and add you know pass transistors. So if you just use pass transistors, I mean here what we have done is we have kind of you know implemented the same logic. I mean the positive S trigger register itself by using pass transistors. We have just avoided the use of these transmission gates. I mean we have splitted them and we have converted or we have used it at different points in the circuit. And this also kind of you know acts like what? This also acts like a positive S trigger register. Both of these implementations have a lower area and a faster one. They are fast because why? Because you know we have reduced the transmission gate delay. Here see how many transistors we have here we have four mosfets and then four inverters that is eight plus four 12 itself so in both these cases we have like 12 transistors right however the problem with this kind of design of feedback is that reverse transmission is possible what do i mean by reverse transmission so in clock like when clock is equals to zero what happens when clock is equals to zero this should be in the hold mode, right? Now, when clock is equals to one, when clock is equals to one, this transmission gate is turned on. Whatever the value is here, it should come here. But it may be the case that you know, if this inverter here, I4, if it is powerful enough, if it is strong enough, it has got a high driving capability, it may actually drive this in the QM node and change its state. See, QM is being driven by this I2, right? And if transmission gate T2 is on, then QM is also connected to this output of inverter 4. Now, if I4 is stronger than this I1, then this node can be driven by I4 itself. Right? So this is called reverse transmission. That you know, I4 is I4 starts to drive it. I mean, the moment transmission gate turns on, I4 starts to drive this node and change the value here. Instead of QM being copied to here, instead of QM being transferred to this T2 and to this inverter and being copied here, I4 actually starts to drive this node and change it immediately after T2 turns on. So what should be done to remove this? You should, you know, reduce what? You should, so this kind of feedback is actually problematic. This is because this is a, you know, a very primitive kind of feedback and that is what is leading to this. So one, one of uh, the ways to improve it is to include this fast transistor in that feedback right to cut the feedback and include a pass transistor that we already told second way is to make this inverter weaker that is why i have shown this as you know small having smaller size as compared to these two inverters if that is the case reverse transmission is not possible right this won't be able to turn this node change switch this node basically and second way is obviously to include these like you know pass transistors in the feedback within the feedback and once we do that, here also we have like four inverters plus two pass transistors. So the total number of MOSFET becomes how, many, how much? So it's still 12, right? Because these four inverters, eight plus these four, 12. However, it's area efficient, right? I mean, they are having same area. This is something which is uh, wrong. It's six. It's actually four P MOSFETs, right? But not six N MOSFETs. It should be eight and MOSFETs. That is wrong. However, since it's a pass transistor thingy, so we will have poor swing or noise margin at some nodes. How? Because this D here it can pass only VD minus VTH. So if it can pass only VD minus VTH, the PMOS of this inverter it doesn't turn off ever, and you have static power dissipation. Reverse transmission here also you will have this case of reverse transmission. So what we do for reverse transmission, we just make the feedback inverter weaker. I mean, you make this feedback inverter weaker over here. And the thing is, you can even remove this feedback inverter. Right? So you can even remove this feedback inverter. And once you do that, the design becomes dynamic design. It doesn't remain a static design. So I told already that this feedback inverter can be removed. But one more thing, I mean, there's another problem with this as well. Why do we want this feedback inverter to be weaker? That is, there's another problem. So even this node over here, transmission gate T1 is driving this gate, right? And the other thing driving this gate is this inverter I2. 
So if I2 is powerful enough, this D won't be direct enough. I mean, this D won't be able to, uh, this D won't be copied here. What will be copied? This QM will be copied here. Or QM bar will be copied here. I mean, the path that it will follow will be this. So there's a competition between this transmission gate and this inverter to dictate the data at this node as well. So what should be done? This inverter should be made weaker. So it should be made weaker for both reasons. First, for eliminating reverse, so for eliminating reverse transmission and also for writing correct data that is D over here. Right? However, all of these cells or all of these designs, they are sensitive to clock overlap or clock skew, which we'll discuss now. So what exactly is clock overlap or clock skew? So ideally, we want the clock and clock bar should be 180 degree out of phase at all times, right? We want them to be ideal complement of each other, or I would say, you know, they should be 180 degree out of phase at all times. However, in practical designs, they are not perfect inversions. What are the factors which lead to this non-perfect inversion? So you have inverter delay. If you are using inverter for generating clock bar out of clock, then you will have an inverter delay and then only it will start, right? So there is this inverter delay. If you're not even using inverter delay, if you're using some other process, then also because of process variations, the delay along two paths is never seen, right? Or the uh, what, should, what should I say? So if you make two identical circuits on a chip, even they are not giving, going to give you identical outputs just because of the process variation, just because of the manufacturing defects. I won't call that defect. I would call that as variation. Right? Also, the length of interconnects. I mean, if clock and clock bar are even, even though they are coming from the same source. But depending upon the length of interconnect reaching a particular you know, register, maybe the length of interconnect for clock bar is larger or for clock is, you know, uh, for clock is larger than that of clock bar. So even that leads to you know, the non-overlap or I would say uh, clock and clock bar not being exactly one degree out of phase. Also, the load capacitances can be different at clock and clock bar nodes. So that may also lead to you know, shift in the phase of these by one degrees. What does it lead to? It leads to overlap between clock and clock bar. And that is what is known as clock skew. And you know, obviously, if clock bar is derived from clock or vice versa, delay is inevitable, we cannot avoid it. So let's see two cases which are possible. If clock bar is lagging behind clock, that is, if clock bar is delayed with respect to clock, if it is taken by inverter or something, then you see this kind of situation is there. So this is clock, and clock bar is delayed by some clock. And in this region, you see both clock and clock bar are zero. In this region, you see both clock and clock bar are one. There's another case. <clears throat> so when both are zero, it's called zero, zero overlap. When both are one, it's called one, one overlap. Similarly, if clock bar, sorry, if clock is lagging clock bar, so it's not clock bar lagging clock bar, that's incorrect. If clock is lagging clock bar, then what happens? The clock is actually delayed after this clock bar here. Clock is delayed after the stop bar. And here also, when you have one one, when both of them are one, it's called one one overlap. When both of them are zero, it's called zero zero overlap, right? So these are the two different cases which are possible. Now let us look at what happens due to this clock overlap in these registers or in this register implementations that we have talked about. So here, so far, we were talking about positive registers where this was a negative latch positive edge triggered registers, but this was a negative latch and this was a positive latch. <clears throat> now to explain your clock skew, what I've taken is a negative edge triggered latch, a negative edge triggered register, where we have this as positive latch, this as a negative latch, and hence it's a negative edge triggered register. Verifying the operation, okay. So when this is, so in a negative edge triggered register, what should happen? Immediately at the negative clock edge, there should be, D should be transferred to Q, right? So let us discuss what happens when the clock is one. So when the clock is one, D is copied to here and then D bar is available here. And since clock bar is zero, sorry, if D like if clock is one, clock bar is zero. So this is not turned on. And you know, this is, and this is in hold state. Now, immediately when the clock goes to zero, then what happens? This stops sampling. So whatever value was here, it goes through this and it is transferred to Q. Right, and the feedback is turned off. So it acts like a negative edge triggered register. We have verified this operation. Whatever data was there at the negative clock edge, I mean, immediately before 
the clock goes to zero, whatever data was here, that is kind of copied to Q. So it's a negative edge trigger register. So <clears throat> for, a neg <clears throat> for a negative edge trigger register, we know that the slave should be in the hold state when the clock is high, right? This should not sample any data from this point when the clock is high. So for a negative clock, so for a negative edge, the negative edge trigger register, this data should change only at the negative clock edge and not at the positive clock edge. That is <clears throat> one of the major definitions of negative edge trigger register. However, when you know clock and clock bar both are one, during this one one overlap, if there is this clock bar lagging clock and there is this one one overlap, then during this period, what happens? This pass transistor is also on and this pass transistor is also on. In that case, what may happen? Even this data can be copied to Q, right? And any change in D can, ref can be reflected at Q. That is a problem. So if these two pass transistors are on, let's see, there is a path from D to Q, which is on, right? Which is transparent. Now, depending upon the delays of these elements, the value of Q may be affected. Or if we change D, and if it passes very fast from here to here, then value of Q may be changed. So this is what the one one dash overlap, it actually represents what the positive edge of the clock, right? So if D is reflected at Q somehow, because of this overlap, at the positive edge, it's just violating the principle of design of negative <coughs> edge triggered register, right? Negative edge triggered register, it should only copy whatever value of D is sampled here at this instance, or whatever value of D was here, it will copy at this instance, the moment the clock goes low. <clears throat> but here, because of this clock clock bar overlap, there's D, there's a path between D and Q. And if the delay is very small in that path, then even D may be copied to Q. And as such, even on the positive edge of the clock, you can have a change in the data at Q, which is not ideal. I mean, which is not actually, which goes against the definition of negative S trigger trace. Q should be in hold mode as long as, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's a positive edge trigger. Okay, so the question is like that. Data, like the thing that I have been trying to explain so far is the data at Q may change even on the rising edge of clock, which is undesirable for negative edge trigger resistance. Now, what does this value of Q depends on during this clock overlap period? So the value of Q actually depends upon whether this D arrives at node X before this falling edge of clock or after this falling edge of clock, not clock, this clock bar. <clears throat> so this is a race condition that is the value of Q here depends upon whether D has arrived at X before the falling edge of clock bar before if it has arrived before the falling edge of clock bar, then it may be passed to Q. So then it may lead to sampling of new data. So if it arrives before the clock clock bar falling edge, D changes the value of Q. However, if it arrives at node X after the falling edge of clock bar after this, if it arrives after this overlap period is finished, then it's fine. The value of Q here won't change, right? So P hold will actually take care of this uh, in real case, but I'll discuss that also. But first let us discuss what exactly is happening or how exactly the value of Q is determined. However, the other problem is if it is sampled in metastable state, I mean, you know, D is kind of changing and at this one one dash overlap period it is changing, but it is halfway through. It is neither one, neither zero. If it is in metastable state, then Q will switch to a state which is defined by system noise. And this is the last thing that you would want in digital circuits, unpredictability or unpredictable outputs, right? You want your output to be well-defined. You want it to be whatever you want. I mean, depending upon inputs, whatever correct value of logic should be there, it should be there. You won't want it to be unpredictable. So what is the solution? Solution is to use non-overlapping clocks. So if you have non-overlapping clocks, then these situations won't won't appear, right? Okay. So let us see what kind of non-overlapping. So non-overlapping clocks can be used to avoid this situation. Now, how can we generate non-overlapping clocks? So non-overlapping clocks, like where there is no one-one overlap, right? So here, no one-one overlap. So one-one overlap was leading to this problem. So we would like to have clocks where there is no one-one overlap. Zero-zero overlap. I mean, this is zero and this is zero. So in like the internal nodes are at high impedance, 
nothing is happening b is not copied to a or even this is not being copied to q that's not that's not a problem however one one overlap is an issue for this and for this kind of like to remove this what we should do is we should use a non overlapping clock where one one overlap doesn't exist so how can we generate such a non overlap clock this is a very simple circuit to generate a non overlap clock from a single clock uh, input so let us look at the timing diagram of this so let's say that there is this clock and the clock goes from high to low if the clock goes from high to low let us follow b because b is equals to clock so the clock is going from high to low and if this goes from high to low here a it goes from low to high now a is 1 b is 0 so for nor gate if any of the input is 1 the output has to be 0 so after a delay of this t nor 1 clock one goes low right so after a delay of this t nor one the clock one goes low clock one is now zero now this is zero and b is also zero so both are zero so output will be one right so clock two will be one after what time instance after a delay of t nor two so after this becomes zero after clock one becomes zero after a delay of t nor two further delay of t nor two then what happens this clock two becomes one right this is what happens now this clock two is one and now let's say the clock goes from 0 to 1 or a goes from 1 to 0 when that happens a is now 0 b is now 1 if this is 1 what happens if this is 1 whatever is here it doesn't matter clock two will go low right it acts like an like whatever is here i mean if it's 1 Then whatever is here, the second input doesn't matter. If this is one, it will go low, right? For an OR gate. So the moment this V goes high, after a delay of T nor two from there, your clock two goes low. And now when the clock two goes low, this is also zero. Then after a delay of further delay of T nor one, that is here, the clock one will go high. This is how it looks like, and you see that in this clock diagram, there is no, you know, one one overlap. Zero zero overlap is there. but there is no one one overlap right so this way you can generate a non overlapping clock with no one one overlap however the problem here is like you can apply this clock one and clock two here and you know avoid that race condition but in this zero zero overlap period there are also some problems what is the problem in this zero zero overlap period flip flop is in high impedance mode why high impedance mode because neither d is connected to a nor you know x is connected to this input so these are floating these are in high impedance mode or these are floating and loop is open i mean there's no connection loop is open gain is zero and the input is disconnected to either of these systems so internal nodes are floating and leakage can destroy the data on internal nodes right that is something which is true. so even this zero zero overlap is detrimental but not as detrimental for the output as the one one overlap here it only leakage can lead to you know change of it will destroy the data but uh, you'll if it if you are clocking it at a high frequency it won't be that case but if it is a race condition you are not sure you know what is q your q may change and that is a bigger problem right now there's other way as well to you know improve these uh, transmission gate mux based latch and that is using different varieties of transistors so here i would tell you how exactly even while using low low threshold voltage transistor you can actually lead to you know a lower leakage so as i discussed that when we use low vt transistors in past transistor based design or you know in any other design then we are actually avoiding that vt minus vth drop but at the same time when we are using this low threshold voltage transistor it increases the leakage but there are certain techniques by which you can reduce the leakage even in those cases and this is simply gating i mean this is simply power gating so i'll be discussing what exactly it means so this circuit over here shows you simple transmission gate transmission gate based latch itself so it's a latch it's not a register first of all so what but you know it has got some different topology as well so in transmission gate based latch what you saw that there was this inverter then there was this transmission gate and then there was again this inverter and then there was this output and then there was this feedback through a transmission gate right 
So this was the latch. But here you see that there are additional inverters and there are these MOSFETs and these sleep signals. What are they used for? What are they? I'll explain it later. So we want to scale the VDD, right? So dynamic power dissipation depends on VDD. Static power dissipation depends on VDD. Dynamic power goes as square of VDD. Static power goes as VDD, I mean proportional to VDD. So if we scale VDD, we are definitely going for low power operation. However, the problem is you can scale VDD, but VTH scaling is limited. I discussed it already that VTH has already reached its limits. You cannot reduce it further because oxide thickness has already reached its limits, scaling limits. Your channel doping is still is already undoped. You cannot reduce it further. So the thing is, you cannot reduce VTH further. Right. So what exactly people can do? I mean, what exactly is the problem when VTH is not scaling? So actually, if VDD minus VTH. That determines your on current. So that is reducing. VDD is reducing, VTH is constant. Your on current will reduce. Okay. Also, the thing is, if VDD is very small, very VDD is very low, right? Or let's say if VTH is high, then what happens? Whatever is passed is actually VDD minus VTH in pass transistor based uh, implementation. And if that is below VM of that inverter, you cannot switch it ever, right? So if Output is fed to inverter, and if it, VDD minus VTH is smaller than VM, you cannot switch it. You cannot switch the inverter to the other state. So, LVT transistors are used, or LVT transistor, like designing the circuit with LVT is preferable to reduce such voltage drop. However, as I told earlier also, LVT leads to high leakage. See, if these circuits, even with LVT, are clocked frequently, I mean, if they are changing frequently, then static dissipation is less because it's not held in the static mode. But in most circuits, what happens? I mean, although the frequency of operation of your processor is like some gigahertz, it is constantly clocked, but not all portion of the processor is clocked. So what happens to conserve power? They use conditional clocking or power getting. Conditional clocking, I already told that you want to conserve energy. So if some of the latches are not in use, you don't clock there. You know, you don't provide clock signal. That is known as conditional clocking. And also there's something which is called power gating. So power gating is something where you know you are not using or you are not applying VDD to those unused latches. So clock gating means you are not applying clock to those unused latches or registers. Power gating means you are not applying VDD to those unused latches or gates. Here, this power gating is done with the help of this sleep, these four transistors and these sleep signals. So during normal operation, sleep bar is equals to zero. Sleep is equals to so during normal operation, sleep is equals to zero. Sleep bar is one. So VDD is passed here. This is connected to ground. So this inverter works fine. Here also this inverter works fine because sleep is equals to zero, sleep bar is equals to one during normal operation. But the moment you want, don't want this to work, I mean you want to conserve power, sleep goes one. And once sleep goes one, this VDD doesn't reach this inverter. This is not connected to ground. And as such, this inverter and this inverter, they don't work. Right? So this is how you know uh, people conserve, I would say, energy on chip. By conditional clocking or power gating. Now, why? So, another thing that we can use is to reduce the leakage. What people do typically is even if you know sleep is equals to zero, since it's LVT, even if these were LVT, there would be high leakage. But what people do is they make these power gating transistors with high VT. Why? Because if this power gating transistors are high VT, the effective current through the inverter or effective leakage current is actually the leakage current of this high VT, right? Since this high VT transistor and this inverters are in series, even though this has low VT uh, transistors, effectively the current that flows through the system would depend upon leakage of this high VT transistor since they are in series. So using these high VT transistors in series with this low VT implementation kind of reduces your uh, leakage current significantly. And this is one of the particular ways which are used in low power circuit designs. So use high VT transistors in series when doing power gating to limit the leakage when latch is idle, that is sleep is high. When sleep is low, go for regular operation. Also, you may see that, you know, we have here two, like one additional inverter as well. Why this additional inverter? Because if it's in sleep mode, then this inverter goes, like this inverter is kind of switched off, right? 
So in sleep mode, this inverter is switched off, and these high BT implementations they kind of hold the prop, hold the value of Q. We don't use this anymore. This is just using the forward path D to Q. But in the hold mode, this is not used. This is just turned off, so as to conserve an R. Okay. So this was all on discussion of this was all that I discussed about uh, transmission gate marks design or latch design, different ways of doing it, advantages and disadvantages of them. Now let me discuss about static SR flip flop. So SR flip flop is you know written by force. I mean the structure of this. I mean the way you implement this SR flip flop. So it's flip flop. That is it's a bistable element. The way you implement it is like this using NOR gates. There's a NAND gate implementation available as well, but it uses two NOR gates in a cross coupled fashion. So here also you have inherent feedback, right? So if you make it like this, I mean, here you can't see that feedback, but here you see that it's having that feedback. I mean, it's like a, so here also you have like gates arranged in this fashion, which we saw in that realization of inverter based bistable right? Here also there's this cross coupled feedback. So this here shows you a truth table of you know your flip flop, SR flip flop. So let's take the case of s equals to zero, r equals to zero. So when s is equals to zero or r equals to zero, if any of the inputs of this NOR gate is zero, what is a? What is output? Output is a bar. Any of the input is zero, it's a bar, right? So if the inputs are zero, if one input is zero, it acts like an inverter, right? So if both inputs are zero, S and R are zero, this circuit actually translates to this, which is nothing but the previous bistable element, right? So whatever value of Q and Q bar were there, it will stay there because it's just acting like a bistable element, right? So whatever stable state it was in, it will remain in that state and it's called the hold mode. Whatever value of Q and Q bar were there, the feedback will ensure that it remains so there won't be any change in that and it's in hold mode. What are S and R? So S and R are basically asynchronous inputs through which you can trigger the change in the value of Q and Q bar. Right? We, we saw that there are two ways of you know uh, changing the values of Q and Q bar. One was to you know include, one was to disrupt the feedback, include a class transistor, which we were doing in the much based designs. Other one is to force or to apply a trigger input so that you know. That trigger input remains for the entire duration of the delay along the path and changes the value of Q and Q bar both, right? So S and R are those asynchronous trigger inputs which change the value of Q and Q bar. We hold the value of S or R equals to I for total delay along the propagation along the propagation path, right? Or along the feedback, and that is how you can change the value of Q bar and Q according to the values applied at S and R, and the force the output to some state. So <clears throat> for NOR gate output is zero whenever any input is one, right? So whenever any input is one, the output is zero. We use like we actually discussed this fact even while discussing about that non-overlapping clock. So if S is equals to zero, what happens immediately? Q bar is equals to zero. Sorry, when S is equals to one. So whenever input in one, output goes to zero. So S equals to one, this S is equals to one, Q bar definitely goes to zero. And when Q bar goes to zero, this is zero, this is zero. So this will become one. So you have Q equals to one, Q bar equals to zero, and we say that it's set. <coughs> Similarly, if R is equals to one, then Q definitely becomes zero. And this is zero, this is zero, then this becomes one. So that is called reset. <coughs> now the problem arises in the situation when you have S is equals to R equals to one. So when that is the case, if S is equals to R equals to one, then Q and Q bar both become zero. However, if both are zero, then this is prohibited, right? This itself, you know, if both are zero, this basically violates the definition of Q and Q bar. Q and Q bar have to be complement of each other, but if S and R both are equals to zero, as long as both are zero, that's right. If S and R both are one, then as long as both are one, both Q and Q bar are zero, which essentially violates the principle of complements, right? That Q and Q bar must be complement of each other. To make things worse, if you switch S and R from here to S equals to zero and R equals to zero, what happens? The value of Q and Q bar are not known. It should be in the hold mode, but since both are zero earlier, 
what will be the value of q what will be the value of q bar or they will be held but what would be the exact value of q and q bar that is unknown why that is unknown because the value of q and q bar are zero so the moment it goes from s equals to 1 and 1 as it as equals to r equals to 1 the value is 0 0 of q and q bar the moment it goes to s equals to 0 r equals to 0 they have to be complements but which one of them will be 0 which one will be 1 you never know and will depend upon the input that changes late that input that goes last to 0 right so that will overall affect so it, it's again a race condition there input which goes so s equals to 1 as going from 1 to 0 r going from 1 to 0 no matter how hard you try you won't be able to you know make these transitions equal and even if they were equal noise in the system would make sure that you know uh, there is a change like this q and q bar they are different so if you are going from 1 1 to 1 to 0 0 state then the output is unpredictable so first when you are going for 1 1 that itself is prohibited because you know your q and q bar are both zero which essentially you know violates the principle of complements and to make things worse if you try to go from one one to zero zero then you're not sure what will the output be you are sure about the fact that it will be held and both of them will be complement of each other but you're not sure whether q will be one or q will be zero so this is again something that you don't want you don't want unpredictability in your system so what should be done if somehow you get s equals to r equals to 1 in your system because inputs are something that are coming from you know other circuits so if somehow you achieve s equals to 1 equals to r then you make next step compulsory as s equals to 1 into r equals to 0 or s equals to 0 r equals to 1 you don't go from this go from this part to this part because it will lead to random output but you know whatever is not fruitful for logic it may become fruitful for some application. For instance, uh, after doing this course, your senior Tejas, he actually came up with this idea that, okay, since it is going to some unpredictable state after going from 11 to 00, why not make it a random number generator? Random number generator are basically used in hardware security applications and they are a part of, you know, encryption, like, in, like your encryption systems and so on. So efficient or a efficient random number generators are required here if it while it goes from 11 to 00 since it's leading to random states every time it is going from 11 to 00 why not use it for random number that is the idea that we worked on and yeah so whatever is not fit for logic you should not discard it it can have some other application right also the thing is now digressing from this this is not at all synchronized with clock right you don't see any clock signal over here it's asynchronous snr but most of the modern circuits they are synchronous circuits right so let us make this sr flip-flop synchronous so let us look at how we can make this static sr flip-flop synchronous so in synchronous circuits what we have is we have a clock input and the output transitions in synchronization with this clock input right it depends on the other inputs as well but it also depends on the clock input so in order to make it synchronous what we do is we start with a you know cross coupled inverter pair so here we have m1 as one inverter and this so m1 m2 making one inverter m3 m4 making the other inverter and what does this cross coupled inverter pair mean simply means that output of one is connected to the input of the other and vice versa so let us look at inverter one which is made by m1 and m2 what is its output? Its output is Q bar, which is feeding the input of inverter 2, which is made by M3 and M4. Similarly, what is the output of this inverter made by M3 and M4? It's Q, and it's feeding the input of the inverter made by M1 and M2. So if you draw it like symbols, so you'll find out that you know if this is your inverter 1, like this, its input is being fed by Q, and then this Q bar is feeding the input of another inverter 2, and its output is Q. So it's like this, right? It's like that feedback loop right and then in order to write in order to write the values of q and q bar you have s and r you know so that is like a feedback so you have that is like a feedback loop so you have this inverter then you have the second inverter like this and then in order to write the data new values of q and q bar you have this s and r inputs and you just add a clock input as well like you just add mosfet so as to write data when clock goes high 
Since you have to synchronize with clock, you add a clock as well in series with those SNR. So that the output changes only when the clock is high. And these values are able to change the value of P and Q bar only when the clock is high. <clears throat> However, there is this problem. What is this problem? So here, if you want to change the value of Q or Q bar, if you want to overpower it, so what you can do is you can only go like make it from one to zero. Either you can make Q or Q bar go from one to zero with the help of these two signals, right? With the help of these pull down. So M5 and M6 or M7 and M8 basically acts like pull down circuits. And what is the pull up? Pull up is basically M2 and M4. Right? And in pull down, you see that you have series connection of M5 and M6 or M7 and M8. If you want to change the state, this pull down circuit should be strong enough to pull this node below VM of the inverters. This node or this node. Right? So this is why this is kind of ratio. You have to make, do you have to match the strength of M5 or you have to make the M, like you have to size M5 and M6 such that it is able to pull these nodes Q or Q bar below the VM. So what is the sizing constraint? Sizing constraint is M5 and M6 should be larger than M2 and M4. Why? Because they are in series. Series combination, even the series combination has to have a larger strength as compared to M2 or M4. In order to pull this, pull this down below VM. <clears throat> And how you can represent a series combination of MOSFETs? So if you have two MOSFETs of equal WRN in series, effectively the resistance becomes twice of this, right? Or the current driving capability becomes half. So it's W by 2L. Effective W by L of the combination becomes W by 2L. If you're talking in terms of W by L, like if you're talking in terms of sizing, effective sizing. <clears throat> so if we have two MOSFETs in series, the resistance add up, try current driving capability reduces. I mean, the resistances add up. So effectively, the current driving capability of this combination reduces to half. And the way to represent it is, we say that the effective size has reduced by half. So it's W by 2L. If two MOSFETs are in parallel, effectively, you have R by 2 resistance or the driving capability increases. Or we say that, you know, effective WL of the combination is 2W by L. So here, what should be done to ensure that this circuit works well? Your pull down network series resistance or the pull down network's driving capability should be larger than this M2 or M4, which is kind of pulling this node up. So, as to make either this node or this node below the switching threshold of those inverters so that you can make a transition. That is what is important. So, apart from that previous asynchronous SR flip flop design using NOR gate, you can also design it using NAND gate. Only, you know, using De Morgan's law, you can see that, you know, the inputs have to be inverted and the output position should be inverted. And here, for 0, 0, you get Q and Q bar, which is whole mode. But for 1, 1, you get output as 1 and 1, which is, again, violating the principle of or definition of complements, and this is private. 